My guest today is Chris Slabicki. He is president and CEO of Modern Resources, an extremely successful Western Canadian gas and oil producer. He's a well-respected, frequently called upon speaker on Canada's energy policy in the world and argues that this country's practice has power to set an example for all and is one of the most prominent voices in reshaping how the energy sector regains its footing and standing in the public discourse on energy and climate change. You've been in the, uh, a long while. What got you into this industry and from the time that you started in the industry? If you could compress it, I know it's a very broad question. What have you learned about it over 30, 40 years? Well, I've been in it for almost 40 years, and what got me into it, I would have to say, is uh, skiing. I graduated from university and came out here to ski, got a job in the oil and gas business, uh, and just loved Alberta. I grew up in Toronto. But I loved Alberta for the uh, work hard, play hard mm -hmm. attitude, and just the, the spirit of Alberta. So almost 40 years later, uh, it's home. Uh, I've raised, you know, I'm married here, raised my children here, so uh, I've been here for quite some time. I'm completely outside the industry. How does someone, you know, you come out of school or at a certain point, 27 or 30, I'm going to go in the oil and gas business. How do you move in there? How do you build a career or become a head of a company? What's the path? How does that work? Well, at the time, uh, Alberta was booming. It was 1981, so jobs were plentiful. Uh, they were not in Ontario, so I, I came out here. And uh, I spent nine years as an engineer, mostly in the field, uh, oil and gas operations. Yep. And then with uh, three colleagues, I started an uh, investment bank, and I spent 17 years in investment banking. And we focused on energy transactions. So we started here in Calgary, mm -hmm. but when we sold the company in 2005 to the Bank of Nova Scotia, we had offices in uh, Singapore, Buenos Aires, Houston, Denver, London, England, and Calgary. And I would say we were the dominant firm in energy transactions in the world, a small Canadian firm from Calgary. Uh, and then after that, I got back into the oil and gas business. This is not butter. I'm genuinely interested. How does someone, almost individual, go from that to, as you just described, you know, a world investment body? I mean, how do you do that? Uh, you know, I'd say a, a trump card we had up our sleeve is being Canadian. Everywhere we went, People respected us as Canadians in the energy business because people looked upon Canadians as being honest, as being hardworking, as being ethical. They looked upon the Canadian in energy industry and still do today as the gold standard of performance uh, operationally, environmentally. So being Canadian was a, a huge advantage virtually everywhere we went in the world. So you have no embarrassments about being in the oil industry? Not at all. Very proud of it. Now that brings uh, up to really, really big point. I think what you say is true, and I'm not agreeing just to agree. I think it is the most professional industry as it's managed in this country. Uh, we both know the, all the benefits that it brings, probably the best, you know, secure employment for so very many people, and then the scrupulosity with which it, its operations are conducted. How comes it then that there has been something almost of a world campaign that has put Canadian energy in the minds of investors outside or in contrast with other countries or in the ability to get projects done. How do you go from such a professionally run and necessary industry to it being you know, the, the pariah dog of, of half the globe? Well, I, I wouldn't agree it's the pariah dog of half the globe. I would say uh, in Canada, the industry has been very successfully vilified. And you go places, and as soon as you mention you're in oil and gas, people, yeah. oh my God, you know. Uh, how, how could you? How can you live in, with yourself? I'll give you a quick story. When we opened up our office in London, England in 1997, so this is 20 years ago now, 20 years plus, uh, I phoned up on a Monday morning the uh, Deputy Minister of Energy because I thought, we're going to be busy here. I should introduce myself, who we are. Mm -hmm. So Monday morning, I phone his office and I speak to his assistant. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm from Calgary, Alberta. We're setting up an office here. Uh, you know, we're going to be doing this and that. I'd, I'd like to set up an appointment with the deputy minister. And she said, uh, just a minute. He gets on the phone 10 seconds later. I give him the same story. I'm Chris. I'm from Calgary, Alberta. Uh, he says, well, why don't you come by at 1.30 this afternoon? And I thought, well, that was easy. Yeah, that was good. So I, uh, I go to see him. I walk into his office and I say, listen, before I introduce myself and my firm, uh, I want to thank you for letting me barge in like this. So I call you Monday morning, here I am Monday afternoon. 
And he said, well, you had me as soon as you told me you were from Calgary, Alberta. He said, I worked for the Department of Industry, which is what it was called at the time, mm -hmm. uh, when we discovered oil in the North Sea. And he said, we had no clue what to do. We had no oil and gas industry here. We had no clue what to do. So we looked around the world and we said, where's the best uh, area, the, the best uh, area for de developing and regulating oil and gas development responsibly? And he said, my colleagues and I ended up spending six months in Calgary, Alberta at the ERCB, which is now the Alberta Energy Regulator. He said, we based our regulations on what you do in Alberta, you're the best in the world. Jeez. And I thought, why do I have to go to London to hear that? And at home, you get vilified. I'd say our opponents to our industry uh, have been very successful and uh, a little bit of looking in the mirror. I think the energy industry has done an extremely poor job of communicating. The energy industry has almost been complicit with its own opponents in, uh, I'll say it, I'll explain it this way, either they don't respond at all, which is a kind of cowardly way of agreeing with something you know is wrong. Secondly, they do know the value of their own industry. And I'm not talking about profits for high executives. Running a country requires energy, but they seem unwilling in the current climate over the last 10 years to state the case for the industry. And thirdly, the politicians, provincial and federal, liberal and Tory, when, when this barrage, I call it propaganda, because that's what it is, especially about a singular industry in a singular province. When this barrage came on, there was no support from the legitimate authorities of the state that was being served by the industry. And finally, okay, I got one more, the news media, including the one that I worked for, but the majority news media will take uh, an alarmist environmental story and they'll spend a month and a half on it. And they will, they will not scrutinize any press releases that come from any radical environmental. Oh, do, do, we got 10 months before the Himalayas disappear. Yeah. That's fine. You guys put a, a decimal point in the wrong place and you'll have the fifth estate chasing you down for the next six years. It's, why, do we, why do we crucify our own success? I, you know, I, I, boy, if I can give you the answer to that, uh, you know, you, you say the, uh, at the beginning that we haven't uh, represented ourselves well. That's very true. I think that's changing. There are a number of CEOs, and not just CEOs, but people in the energy industry speaking up now. Not enough. Uh, and I'm quite vocal about it. I tell other energy executives or anybody in the energy industry, if you're not out there advocating for your, our industry, yep. you don't understand your job. What other issue is more important to our industry right now than the headwinds we're facing within our own country? Exactly. There's nothing wrong with the energy industry on the planet <coughs> Earth. It's only here in our own country where we're getting such yeah. strong and successful opposition. And you, know, you mentioned the federal politicians, and I'm being very apolitical here. All parties are guilty. Uh, I'm looking for the politician who has the guts and the leadership to stand up and say, we are going to develop natural resources in Canada. All natural resources. I'm not talking no, about no, oil mining and gas. Industry is mining, also forestry, they're all suffering. I know they are. I'm looking for the politician who stands up and says, we are a world leader in developing resources. The rest of the world needs, the rest of the world needs our resources. We're going to sit, do it to the highest environmental standards in the world. We're going to do it with full indigenous con, uh, consultation, and we're going to develop them. As an example, I read two weeks ago that. Uh, India announced that they're building a $60 billion natural gas pipeline network. $60 ah, billion. Ah. Dollars, and they're going to do it in the next four years. $60 billion. And because they're trying to get off coal. We all know what happened yeah, two yeah. weeks ago in New Delhi. They had to shut the airport down, schools down, because they couldn't land airplanes. Uh, because they have so much smog. They want cleaner energy. So they're going to develop a $60 billion pipeline network. If only, Rex, I could think of a country that could provide India with clean, responsible LNG to, fix, to fill those pipelines. If you think of that country, you let me know. Uh, Why don't we have a national leader who stands up and says, we are gonna have an opportunity for Canada here and we're gonna help India lead a better the life. World at the same time. Why is that so complicated? And I'll go back to one other phrase you uttered. They, they're hoping, and it's probably a just ambition, that they're gonna build it in four years. Well, in Canadian chronology, that's only half the length of time for you to make the application. How can you have studies and proposals and environmental assessments and, and, and the National Energy Board, how can you spend seven or eight years 
before you even say yes to something. You know, we uh, both grew up uh, in the age of the space race. We both remember Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon, which I would say was the greatest moment in the history of mankind. The entire world stopped that day. I don't care where you are from, the entire world stopped and watched a human being stepped on the moon. In May of 1961, John F. Kennedy gave his, gave his famous speech, yeah. before this decade's out, we're gonna put a man on the moon and bring him home safely. Eight years, two months later, yeah. Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. They didn't have a book, Man on the Moon for Dummies, this is how <laughs> we're gonna get there. They had to design it, think of it, they did it with slide rules. I have more computing power today yeah, in my pocket than NASA had at the time. And they put a man on the moon in eight years and two months. It took us over seven years to improve the Shell LNG project. LNG is being made all over the world. We didn't invent it, we improved it. It took us seven years just to say, hey, good idea. What happened? And then, snap your finger. Uh, we're an energy country. East coast is cold in the winter. Let's build a, a west east pipeline. No, nope, can't have that. TMX, hold it up. Uh, the, the, the tanker ban, oh, can't have that. What is the impulse? And I, I'm not buying that it's, I'm saving the planet, because we don't have the leverage, this one country we are, to save the planet. Why are we tying every single project up and essentially trying to kill the industry that is the cardinal industry? Well, I, I think the pitch, a big part of the pitch has been if we don't build these projects, we're gonna reduce CO2 emissions. If that was the case, I'd be opposed to the projects. But we're not reducing CO2 emissions one bit. No, you're we're displacing them. them to other parts of the world other where standards are not near, uh, not near as high. high. You know, already today, our uh, energy, oil energy in Eastern Canada is imported from other places yes. which don't have nearly the standards we do. And they have no carbon tax. Why? Yeah, they have no carbon tax. Why do we find that acceptable? You know, why we put such an albatross around our own industry for the detriment of our country and for the detriment of other countries, I don't know. Go right back to another point. If, you know, if you imagine a Canada not having some of these things. But, you know, here we are, we have the one resource that I always refer to as being the source of all other energy. Without energy, you don't have industry. That's yeah. all, energy and minerals. So we have it in abundance. God was good. Providence was kind. And we have a first-class standard of life. We have a very wonderful civic code, how we deal with each other and everything else. And yet, it perplexes me that with all that advantage and the skills, the technology, and the conscience to govern how we use them, why are we strangulating? You know, I think it's uh, uh, the price of uh, having such a high quality of life. We take it all for granted. You and I are also both old enough to remember the energy I'm crisis. I'm really old. <laughs> <laughs> We're both old enough to remember the 1973 energy crisis. I remember the Reform Act. That's too... <laughs> you know, <coughs> most people today, uh, especially obviously the, the millennials, young people, they, they weren't even born. They weren't born for another 25 years. Uh, you know, I, I'm not wishing for an energy crisis in this country, but if we had one, the conversation would tr change dramatically because people would stop uh, taking it for granted. You know, we sit here in Canada, we argue about what projects uh, should or should not be built, mostly should not, but that is really the, the price of living in, in the first world and uh, having a very high quality of life. There's, from an energy perspective, there's about a billion and a half people on the world, in the world who live like we do. So this is Europe, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Western Russia. We're the lucky ones on the planet. We have access to energy. That's about a billion and a half. There are six billion people on this planet who don't get to live like we do because they don't have uh, access to energy. The bottom billion people who lead the lowest quality of living, uh, and on average, the billion and a half of us, we use yeah. about 34 barrels of oil of all kinds of energy, barrels of oil equivalent a year. The bottom billion use one barrel. And most of that comes from wood and cow dung. As your energy consumption decreases, your quality of life decreases, your life expectancy decreases, your education decreases, your respect your, for the environment decreases, your respect for the environment decreases, and your chance of dying from respiratory failure increases dramatically because you're burning cruder and cruder energy. We need to get this world energy. No one is better at it than Canadians. We should be the provider for the world. And I am a huge believer in addressing climate change and having a lower emissions future. But oil and gas is part of that. 
There's no such thing as a no carbon future, and Canada is part of that. Here's the, and this is not partisan, even though the, there is a government in Ottawa and it is liberal, but this is not a partisan point. Uh, we are an incidental uh, contributor in terms of global emissions. If, if you buy, I don't buy it nearly as much as you do, by the way, but we are incidental to the output of the vast emissions that are there. China is the, the grotesquely yeah. huge counterexample, not even in the accord, and not bound till 2030, and who believes that they'll be bound in 2030? India, all the other countries that you mentioned. Being so incidental a player, and having no substantial leverage whatsoever to change the destiny of the planet, if the destiny of the planet is what the radical environmentalists say it is, why is there such concentrated and voluminous attention in Ottawa on a problem to which they can only make an incidental contribution at the price, I'll use the same verb, of strangulating a native industry of great success and great intrinsic value? Why are we pretending to be the Galahads of the global warming fight? Well, you know, we have, uh, I believe in climate change, and I believe we have to address it, but I am not an alarmist. But I think we have some alarmists, and I can speak to many political parties here uh, in Ottawa who are setting off these alarm bells to the point we have these 15 uh, oh. young Canadians filing this lawsuit against the government. Uh, it's madness. Canada as a country, we're 1.6% of global CO2 emissions, 1.6. So if we shut the country down, and I don't mean the energy industry, I mean, I mean the, the country. country. We don't drive anymore, we don't heat our homes, we don't mine, we don't produce airplanes, we, we don't produce breathing. steel, we stop breathing. We're gonna reduce uh, global emissions by 1.6%. That's not to say we shouldn't reduce, but how much are we willing to impale this country? To for, to, I went an to a significant amount. I went to a uh, dinner here in Calgary last week. Jim Gray was getting an award from the University of Calgary School of Public Policy, and I'm going to misquote him, uh, but he he had a fantastic, fantastic line in his acceptance speech where he said, "We cannot let the complexity and size of the issue uh, uh, fundamentally." Uh, uh, ruin the foundation of this country to achieve a goal that is not measurable and that we will not be rewarded for. Yeah. And I thought, exactly, that is so well, st he stated it much better, but it's so well stated. Here we are dividing our country. There's yeah. never been such division in this country. That's the point. To achieve a goal which is Out of minuscule. And even if we did it, even if we shut this country down. We have no... What reward are we going to get? Never you know? mind what reward we're going to get. The, the factories of India and China in three days would completely nullify the extinction of all of Canadian activity. Well, and so, it's ironic that the leader in emission reductions has been the United States, yes. uh, who is get, taking great grief because they're pulling out of Paris. Oh, my God, they're responsible for that. They have no carbon tax. They have no carbon tax. They've actually led the world because they uh, found the gas in uh, abundant, cheap quantities and displaced coal. What a good idea. I want you to underline that again. It is an amazing thing that of all the great countries, and of course President Trump is, is, is the target of all scorn and he's the least intelligent. He didn't sign the Paris Agreement. He didn't put in the carbon tax. He lowered corporate rates and he, he let the, the drilling, let the drilling begin. The United States is now the number one oil and gas producer in the world. And as you just stated, and no, very few people seem to know this, Without any of these things whatsoever, the United States has lowered its emissions more than the people who are in power. So why are we doing this? You know, I, I, it's, we've had such an irrational conversation for 20 years, energy versus the environment, big fight, lots of name calling. Yeah, I'm good at name calling. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I kind of look upon it, uh, and I've never taken a survey, but there's probably 10% of the population <laughs> that are uh, ideologically opposed to really any kind of energy. And, uh, and they're really not worth talking to because they're so ideologically opposed. And similarly, there's probably 10% on the other side who don't want to talk about the issues. But the 80% of people in between may lean one way or the other, but they're rational, intelligent, uh, people who want to be informed. Let's have a rational conversation and let's start moving the country forward. You know. I also think that in, in, in what I'll call the war on oil, I sense a tremendous condescension. I'm not talking about the, the industry executives, but you hear Jagmeet or Elizabeth saying, and this is pure pap, uh, we're going to transition 
the entire energy economy of Canada and we're going to find jobs. First of all, doesn't that strike you as extremely arrogant and condescending that someone who's not in the industry, some floating politician, will say to John and Mary and all the rest of them that in all the levels of jobs, hundreds of thousands, someone just walks in, oh, your industry is really not very nice, but we're going we're to transition you. Where, where do they get the, the gall to talk to people like that? You know, I'm not going to mention specific parties because I try and stay uh, apolitical, but uh, in the recent election... We'll dub it in after. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can count on you for that. Uh, in the last election, you know, we had leaders of federal parties saying, uh, you know, we're going to be off oil by 20, 30, 40, or 50, and, and no problem, all the people in the energy industry, uh, we're going to put $400 million into retraining. Yeah. You know what? We invest about $50 billion a year right now, and that's down from a few years ago in the energy industry, $50 billion a year. And you think with $400 million, we're going to make up some kind of jobs to replace this? Like, it, it, it just doesn't work. And secondly, you know, how exactly are we going to be getting off oil? At the same time, these politicians are saying uh, we're going to be off oil. The city of Vancouver is spending $9 billion, with a B, billion, expanding their airport so they can get more and more planes in and out. And they're also building a pipeline to bring in their jet fuel, which is a good idea, and they state it's safer than alternatives. Yeah. What a good idea. So on what planet are we going to be off hydrocarbons? <laughs> are we going to have a reduced carbon economy? Absolutely. Should we be building renewables where we can and it makes sense? Absolutely. Should we be more efficient? For sure. But by end of the century, we're going to be using oil and gas. If these people actually believed what they said, this is, this is another crux that never gets the full attention that it does. They say with irredeemable seriousness, that this is an existential crisis. These are their phrases. That this means the end of human habitation on this planet. That it is a catastrophe of a scale that requires the same energies and vast contributions as World War II. We are ruining the planet. Well, if that's the, if that's the thesis, then the only possible remedy is you abandon all industrial civilization. That's the logic. You can't go any other way. But instead they're talking, once they give you the fact that the planet is going to whirl its way into the sun under, under climate change, then they pass a law about plastic damn straws. Or, or, they, or they go, they're, they're going to make sure people eat less meat. The distance between their avowed projection of how serious this crisis is and the stuff that they're willing to say that they'll do to stop it is, is almost infinite. They're vast hypocrites. I want to be neutral here. <laughs> Very neutral, Rex. I, uh, first of all, it's, it's hard to have with some of these people a rational conversation because it is such an inconsistent, uh, not just point of view and policy, personal behavior. You know, 80% of emissions from a barrel of oil uh, come when you and I start our car or heat our home or fly on a vacation or uh, buy a new iPhone you know, the manufacturing of these things. Uh, and, you know, as an example, the, the city of Toronto, uh, I will mention a politician, Mike Layton, the son of Jack Layton, great politician, uh, suggested a few months ago that the city of Toronto should sue uh, the energy industry for <laughs> emissions. Uh, luckily, Mayor John Tory <coughs> put a stop to that very quickly. Uh, now, first of all, I share uh, uh, Michael Layton's uh, desire to reduce emissions, so we have that in common. But uh, suing the energy industry doesn't reduce a single molecule. So I have a proposal for Mr. Layton. Let's reduce emissions in Toronto. 80% of the emissions come from our cars and, and other uses, heating our homes, as I say, when we actually burn it fl flying on a plane. Why don't we, on the weekends in Toronto, shut down yeah. the Gardner, the 427, the 401, the 407, and the Parkway? No more driving on weekends. Yeah. We're going to reduce emissions. That's a real response. That's a real response. We are reducing emissions. You can measure that. Well, now I can't go to Muskoka to my cottage. I can't go to Blue Mountain skiing. I can't go have dinner with my mom on Sunday night. It's not that attractive. I would suggest Mr. Layton's uh, re-election chances wouldn't be very good. They will not, that, that's the point I was making earlier, that they, they conjure up this apocalyptic scenario. And if they believe their own words, we have to at least reduce the industrial economies of the first world by at least 50% immediately. 
we have to abandon the standard of living. And if you have to, because it's, a, it's existential, that's what has to happen. But no, it's under the umbrella of an alarmist rhetoric that I think hostility to the idea of mod modernity, of oil and gas, a, a kind, of, kind of masochistic distaste for the society that allows you to function even as protesters. Well, you know, it's when I do speak and I do a lot of speaking regarding energy, it's one of my messages, let's just calm down. Let's just put this alarmist rhetoric aside for a sec. There is a, a problem, I believe that. I believe we have to address it. You know, I used the example of uh, India before. If we want to do something material, let's ship LNG to yeah. India. That will be a measurable reduction yeah. in global CO2 emissions that will benefit India. And of course, it's, gonna, it's not altruistic. It's got a huge benefit to Canada. So why aren't we looking at this and saying, yes, this is a problem. We need to address it large scale. Shutting Canada down is not measurable. That's measurable. Let's get on it. We're a, we're, no one's better at this than we are. Let's get on it. But there's such a opposition. The regulatory process is so unmanageable that nothing's and, happening. And also, they've constructed the frame within which this discussion takes place. They have so dominated the communication aspect of this thing, your remarks about the CEOs. Uh, they have so owned, because associating with global warming is a virtue uh, idea, so that many of the news media are, are indistinguishable from the advocates. It's, it is the, I'm rambling, it is the, the lowest form of journalism when you say, okay, it's a good cause, so I'm gonna just support that. You have never seen in 20 years you have never seen one official provincial or federal government justice investigation of the operations of any major environmental industrial organization. Do you examine their claims? Do you test their truth? If they make a, a statement about an industry, is that scrutinized before you take the press release? No. Not a chance. It doesn't happen. You know, I contacted uh, a reporter, I won't mention names, uh, from uh, one of the national newspapers uh, who I know, and I don't speak to a lot of reporters, but I do speak to this one. And uh, I asked him, I said, you know, you just wrote this article. Uh, you know, I've got some good news stories and some positive stories. Why don't you come write a story about what my little company, Modern Resources, is doing, because we've been real leaders in emission reduction. Why don't you write a story about that? And I'd, I'd welcome you, I'll show you around, I'll take it out to the field. Uh, I think you might find it quite interesting. Yeah, well you would. And he said, uh, Chris, good news doesn't really sell. Yeah. And that was the end of that. No, that's also a lie. Uh, they, they, want the, they want the moral halo, the news reporters and the news managers. Uh, we're, we're on side with the fight against global warming. Much like, by the way, when, when the military were most engaged in Afghanistan, the president, we love our military, we'll go rid of it. They want the association with, inverted commas, what the right people think is this great wonderful cause. What news media organization with any sense of integrity or adult thinking would be presenting the idea of this 16-year-old from Sweden as a voice that, apart from a, a kind of public interest yeah. notice of her, but they, on the, Greta says, this is nonsense. I, would, I, I suggested that some some oil executive should find an eight-year-old boy and send him out. You wouldn't, know. Get, you wouldn't get it, you know, Greta would get it, but young George wouldn't be covered. Well, you know, I found it a, a real low point. Uh, was it two weeks ago that, uh, I think it was 15 young Canadians yep. filed a suit against the federal government. Uh, I, you know, I can't remember the exact wording, but for lack of action on climate change, that their future has been uh, destroyed because of this. Uh, and again, we come from the Kennedy era in the United States, and I, I point to Kennedy because he was a, a great uh, speaker and had many great speakers. And, and I think of his line about, uh, you know, ask not yeah. uh, what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So that was 1961. Mm -hmm. Fast forward almost 60 years till today. Uh, there's a new mantra. Ask not what your country has done for you. Ask what's wrong with your country and sue them. Yeah, well, you know, I'm not terribly proud of that, and I don't fault these kids because they're clearly being guided. They're being su uh, supported by the David Suzuki Foundation. You know, they talk about social license in the energy industry. I think the David Suzuki Foundation just lost their social license, and if anybody is a supporter, I would ask them to reconsider. 
to guide these kids to sue their government because this country isn't perfect with all the uh, benefits we have and the standard of living we have everything. because it's not perfect. I have an alternative for those kids and every other kid in the country and I'm very passionate about the next generation and, and, and what they can do and I'm very optimistic. I have another uh, option for those kids. Get educated, roll up your sleeves, get to work and make this a better get, country. Get real education. You know, that's another alternative. Yeah. <laughs> so I got to go to one other big area before I let you go. Uh, we've had the election, uh, and as you know, uh, on, on this side of Ontario, in two major, major provinces, uh, it, it's one party. You've got the Quebec separatist thing seems to have emerged from its cave again and is once more marauding the land. And out here, I'm, I'm going to put this as a question rather than a description. What is the sentiment out here now after the, I call it the decade of assault on the oil and gas industry and the lack of, of, of support from governments? What's the feeling post-election in this province as it revolves around energy and the political, political forces that are playing against it? What do you hear? What do you think? Well, it's, uh, you know, from, on a national unity standpoint, it's dark days in Alberta. I was here during the National Energy Program in the 80s. And there was definitely a strong separatist movement at the time. It's hard to measure exactly, and I was young then, and uh, I may be a little more involved today, so I'm probably a little closer to the subject, but it seems much, much stronger today, the separatist movement here in Alberta. I'm not a separatist. I'm a very passionate Canadian, coast to coast to coast, so it bothers me a lot, but I fully understand the frustration. Not only has there been uh, an, an attack on our industry, we've had uh, a lot of regulation imposed on us, and we're a very highly regulated industry, and we're not against regulation. We should be regulated, as with other businesses, uh, but very punitive regulation, and they don't even consult with us. It's just imposed on us, and not only do they not consult with us, when Andrew Shear came out here to talk to us, they pointed it out. He's actually talking to the energy industry. Yeah, no, it was well, we're the biggest industry in the country. Same, yeah. You know, of course you should talk to us. He met, Everybody, every industry should I talk to us. You know? He's meeting with energy executives. I know. Oh. I mean, isn't that the role of a, of a minister, any minister, to talk to the auto industry, to but talk it, to the banking, to talk to IT, to talk to energy? That's exactly what they should be doing. But we're vilified. He's vilified because he actually spoke to the energy industry. What have we come to? And, well, it also tells you one other thing. It tells you, too, that the, the campaigns and the demonization of what I keep calling the cardinal industry is complete. And secondly, it's like, like some really bad uh, 1970s movie that if, if you're talking to oil executives, you're, you're talking to the Joker and, and all the villains in Gotham City. How did it come to pass? The news media should realize that putting out a story saying they met with the energy industry leadership in the tone that they did is false reporting. It happens all the time, though. I, I, for the life of me, I can't understand it. And I would apply that to every industry, you know, if mining or uh, aerospace. Should any minister in the government be vilified for actually talking to the industry that drives the country? Of course not. Didn't they talk to SNC-Lavalin? I heard a rumor about that. <laughs> I wasn't there, but I heard a rumor. <laughs> that was, the, that was a, a crucial thing. The, the, the line that I got most out of it, I mean, leaving the rule of law alone, is that when he was caught, and it was unavoidable that some sort of response had to be made for this extremely strange behavior, he said, and I quote, when it comes to standing up for jobs, Canadian jobs, I will do all I can. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Job. He could say that about a company that was under investigation, that had a spurious record, that dealt with dictatorships, that did all sorts of stuff, and, and ejected his own minister of justice, when you had hundreds of thousands of jobs out here, and even, even ever so recently in Canada, not a word. How can he live with himself that you could offer this as your rationalization, I have to save Canadian jobs, when the tenure of true regulation and neglect has put a province on the brink of separation? <laughs> If you think of a justification, let me know. I, I don't know how you're, you could You're not going to go I, for that one, are I'm you? not going to go for that one. I, uh, <laughs> I, I don't understand it either, though. But, I, uh, you know, we, we talked uh, a few minutes ago about some of the national leaders in the elections saying we're getting uh, off oil, but we're going to 
help Alberta with a $400 million dollar job transition. place, a transition of 50 billion with 400, I don't know how that math works, but apparently that was the plan. But you know, if that plan comes to pass, the people that should be really worried are in Ontario, because think of the uh, yes. auto manufacturing and parts manufacturing business in Bombardier in Quebec. If we go off oil and gas, they're shut down. I mean, talk about a national uh, crisis. The whole country's going to suffer. It's, it's just madness. Let's have a rational conversation. This, <laughs> this, is, this issue is a spaghetti of contradictions, but it has serious, serious consequences. People think that uh, support for environmentalism is so good and it's nice to get our children involved in it and respect for nature and respect for the world, that there are no negative outcomes. Well, if you stand back just a little bit, this obsession with Canada having to kind of be the Puritan of all Puritans on global warming has unleashed indirectly the separatism bugbear in Quebec. It has agitated Alberta and Saskatchewan to such a degree uh, that it's not the radicals. It's, it's the persons that you meet in a coffee shop or walking down the street or in a hotel lobby. I've spoken with several of them already last three or four days. And their, their point, by the way, it should be made, they don't want to separate. They say, you know, I, I don't know how it's come to this. It's, I never thought I'd say it. But no. we, if we don't get a fair deal, we got to go. I thought Premier Kenny uh, put it well. I saw him speak a couple of weeks ago, and he said, uh, uh, you know, Alberta wants to help the rest of the country with our, uh, yeah. by developing our energy, as we have for the past, you know, decades. If we can develop our energy, it's good for the whole country. We want to help the whole country, you know. And I thought, you know, very well stated. Very well stated. Last question to you. This is an easy one, really easy. If uh, if Fort McMurray was near London, Ontario, do you think we would be having trouble getting pipelines built? You know, I no. I think <laughs> I, it would be the fast answer. Well, but I, I think it's really easy. It's really easy when you're sitting, uh, not to pick at Ontario, but Vancouver, Halifax, yeah. Newfoundland, anywhere. Yeah. When you're sitting there and Alberta's far away, Absolutely. it's really easy to vilify an industry yep. or a company even, but it's much harder to vilify a person. And that's why I think executives in the oil and gas business have to start speaking out. We're people too. I care about this country as much as anybody else. Yeah. I care about the environment as much as anybody else. My wife and I, we spend our holidays, we, we don't go on cruises, we, we don't go uh, uh, on golf junkets, we go cycling, we go canoeing, we go backpacking. That's and, what we like to do. We join Leonardo DiCaprio on his yeah, yacht. exactly. <laughs> I have yet to meet a reporter on any one of those trips, but I, uh, you know, I care about the environment uh, as much as any yeah. other Canadian. But that's why I think it's important to get people out there. Yep. It's really easy to vilify an industry. It's far away. They're bad. We're good. Yep. It's much more difficult when you put a person out there and realize they're just like And you. I think the only supplement to that, and I'll stop, it would be, it would be so good. I did a cross-country checkup. I took it up to Fort McMurray. and We met some of the executives, but I, I met 500 of the people who were actually the workers. And that's the one voice in all of this. I think if you could get some 50-year-old engineer or another guy out working the crane or the woman who's in there doing the gas line or something, someone should assemble the people who are still remaining in that industry and, and have, a, have a conversation with them. How is this affecting you? you know, you've, been, you've been under this, this opprobrium uh, and you've lost billions in capital if you would have jobs left. Put that face out there. These are not world destroyers. Yeah. They love the planet as much as Elizabeth May. I think, uh, you know, people's view of the average oil worker is, uh, you know, drill, baby, drill, who cares? Uh, you know, I love going out to the field. Our operations are just southwest of Grand Prairie. I love going out to the field and meeting our operators and the rig crews. They care. Yeah. They live there. You I think know. they're going to destroy it? They live there. And... Uh, I go out there and they tell me, oh, Chris, look what we've done here. We, you know, we've done this and, you know, we've reduced emissions here and we've saved $100 here. Isn't this great stuff? And they're so proud and enthusiastic yes, yeah. of what they do. I'd love to get some of those people in to talk to Elizabeth May or other leaders and just talk to these people. Yeah. Believe me. And what I would say, too, they're actually doing something about it. They're not just talking. They're actually doing something about it.
that, that's, that's an extreme point. I, I have met, I really have, over the years here, a lot. And, you know, it is, I, I put it this way, it just simply isn't fair. A man or a woman wants self-reliance, gets sufficient education, or if it's just labor, uh, but is honest enough to put the labor to work, doesn't have to depend on, on largesse from a government, feels the integrity that he's maintaining his or her family, and then when his, his honest labor, honest week, you look at it and he, he reads the newspaper, you're, oh, you know, you are, you're, you're the savages of the planet, you hate Mother Earth, you're going to kill Gaia. And a lot of these people in these, in these industries, either in Canada or abroad across the world, the hardest workers and they feel like they're villains. I tell these people uh, who are flying all over the place spreading this word, it's really easy to be an environmentalist yeah. when you're telling other people what to do. It's really difficult when you have to look at what you have to do and you know, pick exactly. your person flying all over the world, spreading the word, going to conferences. Canada spent over 300 delegates to I Paris, know. 300. You think if we sent 250, it would have been a different, out or 50, it would have been a different outcome? It's madness, but it's always the other guy. And Alberta is easy to pick on because right. for most of the country, it's far away. Oh, those guys are bad. Uh, and also, if, if they just take care of it, we're good. Also, it doesn't you're, work you're in the social category, forgive me for saying this, you're, you're the kind of soft Texans. Uh, so you can be dismissed as, as certain on a peasant level. That's true, by the yeah, way. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's a condescension and a class game going on in this. Very last thing, and then we'll let you go. This is just a personal tick. Whenever I hear Catherine McKenna say, we have to put a price on pollution, <laughs> and she's talking about the tax on carbon dioxide, is she deliberately misusing these terms? And is she trying to get the idea, oh, this is like soot or sludge? They're not putting a tax on pollution. They're putting a tax on carbon dioxide, and it may be many things, but it is not, you know, orger running down the stream. I don't know. Uh, you don't where, speak honestly. I completely agree. I've never met Catherine McKenna. I have tried, uh, but uh, so far, she was not so far. So far, just not agreed to meet with me. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I, uh, you know, she says uh, it's no longer free to pollute in this country. Uh, I don't know where Catherine McKenna lives, but I'm going to move in right next door because I don't know any place in this country where energy has been free. It's always cost money. Yeah. Now that it costs 4.4 cents a liter more. She's trying to say, okay, well, now we're all going to become responsible. We're going to cut back <coughs> our consumption. Uh, it's irrelevant. Um, I'm it not is. speaking for or against a carbon tax, but if, you think, if she thinks it's going to change our ways and all of a sudden we're on our way to a low-carbon economy, it's madness. It's completely irrelevant. And it's, and also, I don't get, it, but it makes good politics. But it is not a carbon tax. It's a carbon dioxide tax. The carbon dioxide. She wants to tax soot. Anyway, you're very kind. You give me a lot of your time. I and enjoy you speaking with, to you. You put up with a, with a lot of nonsense from me, too. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.